Father, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for this time together, and we invite you into our lives and our hearts. We pray, Father, that through your Holy Spirit, you would open our lives to what you have for us in the days ahead as we commit this hour and ourselves into your hands. In the name of Yeshua, our coming King indeed. Amen. Well, we're going to explore something that I like to call the once and future church. The church of the past is also the church of the future in a very unique way. We're going to talk a little bit about the ecclesiastical challenge of the end times. We talk about the end times a lot, prophetically, and things are changing. Well, what are the implications of that for us as leaders? And so that's what we're going to explore. Our agenda is going to deal with four issues. We're going to explore the ecclesiastic history of the church, as we call it. We're going to talk about more specifically our present predicament. What makes our predicament unique uh, today? And what then, in response to that, are our resources? And they're very distinctive and very unique. We're going to try to touch on that. And then we're going to talk about some specific challenges, particularly in doctrines. There are certain doctrines that we can relax and have different views on. There's others that are more critical. We'll try to highlight that briefly. And then we'll talk about a resource that you need to understand, which is very unique. And we'll talk a little bit about that. So we'll start now with the ecclesiastic history of the church. And so we're going to review the prophetic profile, what we talked about last night to some extent. And then we'll review that from a secular point of view. And we'll talk about the age that we're in, which we'll call the Laodicean age. And so just to highlight last night a little bit for those, because we have some newcomers that have joined us here. You know, John, who wrote not only his gospel, but had the experience on Patmos, certainly must have been puzzled. And his Patmos experience, we believe, occurred prior to his writing the gospel, by the way. Just, he, he wrote the gospel at the very end of his life, interestingly enough. And he had the benefit of the Patmos experience. But he certainly must have been puzzled. Because while exiled on Patmos, he received the most fantastic, most elevated vision ever given uh, to anyone on the planet Earth. And he must have been really puzzled because he sees the resurrected Lord in chapter 1. And uh, here is the resurrected Jesus dictating report cards to seven representative churches. And what must have puzzled John is our Lord, standing there, was so sick he's about to throw up. I will spew thee out of my mouth, he concludes. In chapter 3, verse 15 17, he's speaking of the Laodicean church. He says, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would, thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, wow, I will spew thee out of my mouth. What a strange reaction or response from the Son of God Himself. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods, and have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. What an indictment. I will spew thee out of my mouth. Now, from all of that last night, with, uh, just by way of refreshment, as we could, to be a springboard for where we're going, remember the prophetic profile. It's amazing how few commentators really analyze chapters 2 and 3. If you've studied our commentary on Revelation, one of the most popular things we've done, by the way, but you'll, you'll discover that we spend a substantial amount of time on each of the seven churches. But to summarize that, we have Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Seven churches that the Lord chose because they were representative of what He was trying to communicate. And uh, several of these are well known, several of those you probably never heard of prior to this passage. Ephesus speaks, the, the name, all the details of the letter deal with a theme that is clearly relevant to the early apostolic church especially. And Smyrna, the persecuted church, Pergamos, the married church, and uh, Thyatira, what I'll call the medieval church, the denominational church, and then the missionary church, and then the apostate church. What do we mean by that? We're going to get into that today a little bit. But as we looked at all of this, we realized that the first three letters were uniquely structured. That the promises to the overcomer were as a PS outside the body of the letter. 
In contrast to the last four, where the promises to the overcomer are in the body of the letter that gets our attention. Somehow those two, the, those clusters are two mutually exclusive clusters. And we also notice as we examine the second group more closely that they're unique in that they each included an explicit reference to the second coming of Christ. So that gives us a perspective that we want to understand. And we also discovered that of the last four, one of them had an explicit threat of being cast into the Great Tribulation if they don't repent. Profound passage there in that namely that uh, uh, if they do repent, they would, they would miss it. And that's a big controversy among some, but uh, uh, we think the scripture is really quite clear about for, for a number of other reasons on that, that very topic. But we also, in contrast to Thyatira, Philadelphia's promise that they would be removed from the time, not just from the tribulation, the great tribulation, but from the time of the great tribulation. And so that's a promise of the rapture. Very precious. Astonishing, actually. And uh, both of these conclusions are supportable from other passages too, but by way of summary, this seems legitimate. Well, that leaves two that are uh, problematic. Sardis and Laodicea. If Thyatira represents the Vatican and what have you, Sardis must represent the Reformation. And he says, you have a name only, but you're dead. That's the Lord Jesus talking. Every one of these seven were surprised. Every one of these seven churches uh, were surprised by the report card. Some that thought they were doing well were not. Some that weren't doing very well were doing better than they thought. We need to understand that each report card was a surprise to its recipient from our Lord itself. But we also looked, as we looked at the structure, the seven elements, the name, title, commendation, the concerns, the exhortation, and the promise of the overcomer uh, were distinctive for each one. And there are two that had nothing bad said about them. Both Smyrna and Philadelphia had no, had no uh, concerns. Two of them had no commendation. Sardis didn't, and we've discovered Laodicea had all the elements, but not, no commendation. It's one of the two that had nothing to commend it. Wow. Provocative. So we're going to do a little historical review from a secular point of view. 31 B.C. through about A.D. 14, of course, it was Augustus, and that was when Jesus was born during his reign. And then uh, A.D. 37, we have Tiberius took over, and Christ was crucified in his reign, just to give you a perspective here. And then following that was Caligula, and he tried, but was unsuccessful at trying to desecrate the temple. Very interesting issue. He tried to do something that would have been the abomination of desolation a second time. And he wasn't allowed to. Very provocative event. We can talk about that in the breaks. But then came Claudius, and then Nero, of course, with his persecutions, trying to blame the burning of Rome on the Christians. And he's the one that, of course, executed Paul. Wow. And uh, then we have a couple of would-be guys that didn't make it until Vespasian finally said, enough of this, and he took over. And so Vespasian, he's the one that took over, and then and during his 10 years, destroyed Jerusalem, the famous fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD. He had his son Titus follow through on that. And then Titus followed him. And then we have Domitian. He had a violent uh, abuse of the Christians. And that's, it's during his reign that John is ba banished to Patmos to receive the revelation. Then we have Trajan, and that's where um, Christianity was regarded illegal. There were formalities of emperor worship instituted. Then came Hadrian. And then Antonius Pius, and that's when we had the revolt by Bar Kokhba that leads, of course, into uh, 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 Jerusalem being leveled and Aila Capitolina replacing it. And uh, then we get to Marcus Aurelius, and he was the most severe since Nero. Most people don't realize. A very educated person did a lot of positive things to the empire, but not from a Christian point of view. That was the peak of Roman uh, power. You've all seen the movie The Gladiator. It may surprise you to know that was based on some facts. Because Commodus, who took, was took over, was killed in the arena. Did you know that? I was surprised to discover that, that, that while the movie's a movie, it still it was based on some, uh, uh, some history. But then we have a whole series of what's called the Barrack Empire. There was civil war and army. Uh, it, it, it gets very turbulent for quite a while. And it doesn't, uh, when you get to the, the beginning of the third century, we have Christianity starting to be tolerated. And then as you get to uh, some that are favorable to it, and then we finally get to uh, Phillips, 
in the 244 and following where he, he was favorable to Christianity and uh, then his successor persecutes them. It gets, it's very volatile and uh, on again, off again kind of thing until you get to Diocletian. By then he persecutes Christians furiously, most severely. And he systematically attempted to abolish all Christianity by tortuous deaths. That's he, was, he had a campaign to do that. Really bad news for the Christians. The catacombs of Rome. Hundreds of miles of graves. Two to seven million is the estimate among them. It's in this area that the Nicolaitans show up. Nicholas is one of seven deacons, apparently, according to Acts 6.5. Uh, and it, that he was later influenced by Greek dualism. He was a deacon originally, but then he gets... Uh, impressed with the Greek thing, and he develops he developed what we call today the clerical doctrine, the idea that you have a clergy and a laity. Those things we take for granted. No, they were invented uh, subsequently. Nikeo means to conquer above others. Laity, the people, conquering over the people. The concept of the Nicolaitans is the, what we call today the clergy. And there are two letters to the Clement and Roman AD 100, and letters to Ignatius of Antioch that highlight some of this. The whole idea of elevating a bishop to be the autocratic head of the local church. That concept is something we take for granted pretty much because of history. It was actually invented back there in those early years. That leads to an era that the previous thing we called Pergamy, if you will. In 220, Origen, uh, a very, very prominent expositor of the Word of God, he, he among other errors he introduced, he, he was hev heavily, heavily allegorical in his view of the Scripture. But he introduces infant baptism back there in 220. That was a new idea. And uh, Constantine then adopts Christianity in 312. He didn't uh, authorize a state religion. He just, he just adopted it himself because it was politically expedient. There are three groups of sun worshipers that he embodied by making Sunday a holiday. That was a shrewd political move. But he did it for his own administrative reasons. But in 325 he issues the Edict of Toleration. He endorses Christianity is religion, so they came out of hiding from the caves into the silks of the court. And so uh, suddenly Christianity is no longer illegal. That was what they were, that was a burden that they had up till then. Once it gets stayed endorsed, everything was better. No, it became spiritually worse, actually. And uh, house churches were first, of course, outlawed. And uh, then we have the Council of Ephesus. Mary was worshipped as the mother of God way back in 431. And then Leo the Great was named the Bishop of Rome as some kind of super leader. And that, of course, goes on. And uh, uh, Valentin uh, confirmed as the spiritual leader of the Western Empire. And then we started a common priestly dress code in the, in the beginning of the 6th century. Justinian then had a state-ordained church. Get the picture now. Pastors are on the state roll. Suddenly it was a legitimate profession by the state. That eliminates the spiritual dimension, actually. Bonavis III was the first pope of the Catholic Church back in 607. No, it wasn't Peter. That's a myth that they try to promote. But uh, kissing the foot starts in the 709. Worship of images and relics develops in 786. Use of holy water in 850. Canonization of dead saints starts in 995. And uh, fasting on Fridays and before Lent is introduced. And then the celibacy of the priesthood was instituted. And that was, of course, a really boon for the prostitutes. That's a whole other story. Um, 1090 is the prayer beads are adopted from paganism. And the Inquisition begins in 1184. Jews, witches, and anybody else that was politically expedient was picked on. And uh, Pope Innocence IV officially establishes the Inquisition. And uh, boy, what, what crimes were produced under that banner. The sale of indulgences. You, you can sin all you like if you can afford it financially. And then transubstantiation of water and the wine is introduced in 1215. These are when all these ideas that we uh, 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 are invented, if you will, by, through in history. Reading of the Bible was forbidden to laymen in 1229. That was the power of the church, the control. It was a, uh, the, the whole idea of the priesthood. And the communion cup was forbidden to lay people. 1414, that was a special privilege reduced. 1439, the doctrine of purgatory was decreed. These are relatively recent ideas. 1492, that's when the Jews were outlawed in Spain. That's why Columbus had to, he and his crew, sail. 
And there's a whole story behind that you can check into. 1545, tradition granted equal authority with the Bible. That's the primary divide between Protestant and Catholic perspectives. Is the Catholics hold tradition, uh, in some of them, above the Word of God itself. And uh, these ideas are reaching a climax, which leads, of course, to the Reformation. It didn't start with Luther. He just codified it to a certain degree. That actually started a little bit earlier, but Luther's famous 95 Theses nailed on the door of Wittenberg Castle, the, uh, 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 Chapel. The uh, uh, Zwingli, uh, Malachan, and uh, Calvin, John Knox, others had already started, and that was the Reformation, which was made possible by a technological advance. Gutenberg Press. The Gutenberg Press made the Reformation possible. It's amazing to realize how that technical advance, movable type, changed printing, which changed, made it possible to have copies of the Word of God for everybody. What a radical idea that was. People died and still are for that privilege. And we need to realize that. We also have a technological advance which makes our lives possible. It's called the Internet. It's amazing, the implication. We'll get to that. And so in 1526, we have uh, reversions to traditional forms of services. That there was form, if you didn't follow those forms, you were an outcast group. In 1530, all lay pastors teaching publicly are to be killed was the dictum. That is in the, among the Protestants. It's not an abuse of the Catholic Church alone. When the Protestants were in charge, they did the same kind of thing. And disciples jailed and so forth. When you get to 1600, there were over 40 different translations from the Latin Bible. So the promotion of the Word of God, with all its flaws, is going on, and it's praise God for that. And then the Huguenots, and public executions among ten thousands. The persecutions continue. Fourth century, canonization by the state, of course. Independent fellowships outlawed and persecuted. And in the Reformation, soteriology reformed. They did, the Reformation did an incredible job in the field of soteriology, salvation by faith alone. Many were willingly burned at the stake in their commitment to, fa to, to uh, uh, salvation by faith alone. And, uh, but the, the tragedy of the Reformation, they didn't go any further. They didn't go on and re-examine their other beliefs they were carrying from the past. So all kinds of erroneous traditions were retained. And that's our challenge today. And Protestant leadership continues to persecute deviant groups adhering to biblical doctrines. And there's a book by Broadbent that's called The Pilgrim Church. It's amazing to discover the real history. Um, and that's where we also encounter the Quattro Decimans. Look in any encyclopedia, secular encyclopedia, look up Quattro Decimans. It's a Latin term for 14. And you'll find out there was a group of believers that held the Word of God tightly. And they wanted to celebrate Passover on the 14th of Nisan, as the Bible expressly requires, and they celebrate the resurrection of the Master on the third day after that, on the 17th. But because they build their worship around the uh, announcement of Passover on the 14th of Nisan, they were called Fourteens, and they were excommunicated by the early church. The early, one of the shocking things to discover is how anti-Semitic the early church became. The leadership there tried to blame Christ's crucifixion on the Jews, and they tried to separate themselves as, as aggressively as they could from anything Jewish, which of course was tragic for the Jews. The abuses under the banner of Christ throughout history is a shock if you haven't studied it. And, uh, but the flip side is also true, it was tragic for the church. We lost our Jewish roots, and we're beginning to rediscover those, praise God. And so, you want to check that out. But it ought to be obvious to even the casual observer of history that the real story of the church is not the one recorded in secular history. Those intrepid believers, which the Bible says, of whom the world was not worthy, were not only persecuted by civil authorities, they were denounced, defamed, and decimated by the professing church of the time. You'll quickly discover that throughout history there were small remnants whose labels come from their enemies, by the way. 
Um, we'll, we, uh, who were the Waldensons, the Lollards, the uh, Stundists, the Anabaptists? Most of us don't know unless you've done some homework. And if you do, you'll find the information from their enemies, not from themselves. These names were given by their enemies to those who claimed only the name of Christ and who were prepared to suffer for His cause rather than submit to those man-made traditions that they believed contradicted the Word of God. Wow. Some of those groups had views you might not agree with, but the main point, understand what they were clinging to and the penalty they paid for clinging to it. Praise God for that. Now, the Anabaptists, between 1535 to 1546, 30,000 were killed. Well, it is Convertical Brotherhoods. So they, they, they have all kinds of labels we could go through. Dozens of them you probably have never heard of unless you've done some homework. And there is a bibliography in your, in your workbook. And of the whole list, I underscore the one I meant to, I forgot to, uh, by Broadbent, the Pilgrim Church. An incredible document. It was out of print for many years, fortunately, through the activity of Dave Hunt and some others that got back in print. Broadbent. And uh, it'll, give you, it'll give you the whole history of what he calls the Pilgrim Church. The whole concept of church. Well, it, was, it became a building, a cathedral or a church. We use that term in, interchangeably. And it, it all, always involved a special day Sunday. Show me in the scripture where that's called for. Professional a leadership, a priest, a clergyman, or a pastor. The concept of a professional clergyman is part of history, not the Bible. And uh, a special service performed for the people, ceremonies, interpretation, motivation. That model is from the third century on. And a way to maintain itself, tithes and offerings, of course. And so, uh, okay, that's a quick snapshot of the ecclesiastic history. Very superficial because of our limit limitation on time, but you get the flavor of it. So let's talk about our present predicament. Where are we now as, as uh, heirs to all of that history? A couple, I'd like to ask you just two questions. There's dozens I could, so I just, can, I just picked two. Why is the divorce rate among Christians no better than among unbelievers? Something's not working. In fact, some, the, some of the statistics say it's even worse within the Christian body, but be that as it may. Another question. What is really meant by the commandment, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain? We've all heard that preached on. Most of us associate it with swearing or pro, you know, uh, uh, vile language. It's not about vocabulary. It's not about vocabulary. I can prove from the scripture what that's really all about. It's about ambassadorship. If you're going to take the name of the king, you better be prepared to represent him competently and faithfully. Because the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. You're going to take the name of the king? Fine. Praise God. But that implies you're going to prepare for it and cling to it faithfully. These are, these are strange ideas to many ears. See, there is a regeneration gap that we all notice. It's over, it's, it's by, by one survey, I'm not the most up-to-date on the survey, this is a few years old, but it's, it's be, it'll be representative for us. Over 2,000 churches are planted per week. Wow, that's exciting. 150 million, about 74, going to 650 million in 1998, and yet there's a silent exodus of people go, slipping out the back door. Almost unnoticed. The statistics don't pick that up. Attracted, but not contained. Interested, but not inserted into fellowship. Harvested, but not gathered. Touched, but not transformed. Looked in briefly, but were disappointed by what they saw. I won't ask for a show of hands. So our ecclesiastic challenge, biblical illiteracy is extent. It's astonishing to discover the biblical illiteracy that's in the Christian body. So much so that the principals of the Christian schools in New Zealand did a survey and concluded that over 75% were biblically illiterate and wanted to do something about it. And they approached us, interestingly enough, in our early times here to find out, can we help? 
We showed them what we do with the Institute, and they were enthralled with it, so much so they signed up to be members just for themselves to repair their own illiteracy. And we, in a week from now, are having an awards banquet. We're awarding, I forget, a couple of dozen people who have gone through to what we call the bronze level by their own volition and are excited about that and are asking us to help them adapt that into their curricula for the school. I'm not talking about churches, the school, the Christian schools. To go from the principals to the teachers down to the, to the kids. What a fabulous admission and action plan. They're doing something about it. And so biblical liter literacy. Let me extend that. I just mentioned that because it's an exciting thing going on here in New Zealand. In America, we're probably better informed what's going on in America than we are anywhere else. And let me tell you, the biblical illiteracy in the pulpits is a shock. People work hard, go through seminary, and learn a lot of interesting things, but they don't learn their Bible. The biblical illiteracy in the pulpits is astonishing. And we're talking about pastors, not just the, how are the people going to learn? Many churches have people in the congregation that are better informed about the Bible than their pastor is. Wow, okay. So, the embracement of allegorical myths. In other words, part of the problem, those that know the Bible or something about it have also been victims of, what's, of what we call a soft hermeneutics. Well, that's just a figure of speech. That's just an allegory. You don't take that seriously. Really? The kingdom, the millennium, is not taught in nine out of ten churches. They're against it. They believe it's an allegory. They ignore the 1,800 specific references in the Old Testament and the 300 references in the New Testament to the fact that Jesus is coming back to rule on the planet Earth from the throne of David and so on and so forth. It's astonishing that those ideas are not only not taught, they're fought against by nine out of ten churches. Wow. Allegorical myths. The centerpiece of Israel. One of the things we like to point out is that if you go to any pastor's study, you'll find a set of books that he got when he was in seminary called Systematic Theology. Different authors, depending on where they came from, but the, the table of contents are pretty much the same on all of them. Take them out and take a look at them. They have a section on angelology, a section on bibliology, all the different sections. Of, and there's a segment that is not in the table of contents that constitutes five-sixths of the Bible. You won't find it in any of the systematic theology publications in any pastor's study. What is the thing that's missing? In Israelology, the study of Israel as an instrument of God's plan of redemption. Not Israel just nationally, no, Israel as a concept of God from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22 is not taught in the seminaries. Are we surprised that there's a vacuum, that there's a hole in their perspective? Wow. The centerpiece of Israel is a controversy to this day and will be until the rapture. When things are going to change. I often announce to the shock of my friends that I've become a replacement theologist. You really? You're kidding? Because they know I believe that's a, that doctrine's out of the pit of hell. No, I'm a replacement theologist. I believe that Israel is going to replace the church. And everybody laughs because they realize the ellipsis I'm talking here because after the rapture, that's exactly what God is going to do. He's going to deal with the planet Earth through Israel. Jesus is Jewish. He's the king of Israel, and he's going to rule the earth as such. That. Anyway, and the eminency of the return of Christ. It's amazing how con controversial a, 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 an awareness that Christ may come back at any moment. All through the New Testament, you know, that you're cautioned to live your life in an, in a, in an atmosphere of expectation. That's controversial. Boy, that puts you in a fringe group. You're, you're, oh, you're one of those. Gosh, I sure hope so. Because there's a crown that Paul promises Timothy for that. So, see, we've embraced all kinds of pagan fallacies that are an anathema. We are victims of legacies of what I'll call pseudoscience. Most of what you've been taught about astronomy in college is not true. Gravity is a non-player outside the solar system. The distance becomes so great, and those distances get squared, and they're in the denominator. It renders gravity irrelevant in any kind of distances you encounter in astronomy. The sky is electric. The, the, the plasma physicists have been trying to tell us that for decades, and no one's listening. They're finally starting to realize it. 
And the current uh, perceptions in science today, the cutting edge, is that the universe is holographic. It's some kind of super hologram. David Bohm first suggested that possibility when he and Einstein were exploring that, and now we're getting evidence that seems to confirm that. It's, not, it's still controversial, but it's, the evidence is pointing in that direction. And that's interesting because in a hologram, distances are synthetic. They're not real. Pull distances, those imaginary distances out, and what happens to geology? What happens to the Big Bang, etc.? And you suddenly discover what you're left with is exactly what the Bible has been saying all along. The more you know about science in the cutting edge today, the more comfortable Genesis 1 reads. And the Gospel of John, and the book of Hebrews, and so on. Boy, if you want to you facilitate your evangelism to the, the unwashed, all you need to do is puncture the holes in the pseudoscience that's commonly taught. And the electric sky versus gravitational models... Uh, the bound, that our reality has boundaries. The Bible's described that all along. Nachmanides, a Hebrew sage in the 13th century, pointed out that from the text in Genesis, that the universe has four dimensions, and it has ten dimensions, only four are directly accessible. And that's what we, the particle physics, have, uh, the uh, quantum physicists have spent mil billions of dollars creating atomic accelerators to discover, guess what? We have at least ten dimensions, only four are directly addressable. No kidding. Nachmanides took a shortcut. He went to the designer's manual. <laughs> evolutionary myths. It's amazing how many scientists, I think they're in the thousands, that have certified the idea that evolution no longer is a satisfactory explanation of what we know about the universe. Michael Denton started that trend and back in 1986 with his Evolution, A Theory and Crisis book. Michael Behe, William Dembski, and... Uh, uh, Philip Johnson and others have written book, three, four or five books have been written in the last few years that decimate evolution as a, a satisfactory explanation. And yet, we're not just criticizing micro, uh, biology. Microbiology has shattered the idea of evolution. Microbiology has proven that the entire world is digital, a, a digital simulation in the first place. But what's amazing is our entire culture is based on evolution, not just, not just biologically, our psychology, our laws, our political science, all presume evolution, strangely enough. And so, and then in, and on top of it, the dream of thinking man for s thousands of years has been the pursuit of truth. That was the great dream of all the great minds, is somehow find truth. And they'll write and argue about how to get there and so forth, but that was the pursuit of mankind to pursue truth. That's why you went to college, to somehow learn right from wrong and to understand truth. And we, we deny the existence of truth. You have your truth, I have mine. Two plus two is four for you? Well, that's pretty good. What is it for you? You know, 3.9, 4.1, I mean, what are your, what, truth is truth, right? No, not in today's world. Relativism. We remove the reference points and then wonder why no one has any sense of direction. We teach our kids that they're, 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 they're the result of some cosmic accident and then wonder why they have no concept of destiny. We have deliberately disconnected the, their destiny from their character. The dream was that with good character you would ultimately prevail. That was the concept that we built in. Not anymore. So we wonder why we go to relativism and why it's the me generation, why everyone's out, why there is widespread corruption from the top down of virtually every government. It's amazing in America, of all that it originally stood for, for two centuries, it's astonishing to see the corruption in the executive branch, the corruption in the legislative branch where they write, they sign laws they've never read, in the judiciary where they make no pretense of trying to uphold the Constitution. They, the concept of America was a republic that didn't hold its allegiance to a person, it was to a rule of law. And they just shredded the rule of law. There is no more constitution. Their Bill of Rights was abrogated uh, New Year's Eve recently. I mean, last, last New Year's Eve. So on it goes. So the point is that the, we've removed... The, the, and we wonder why there's corruption everywhere. In the media, uh, in the schools, astonishing. And so off we go. We live in the age of deceit. That's one of the aspects we need as leaders to understand that almost everything that people have been exposed to and believed to is not true. It's deliberately fraudulent. The prostitution of the media 
and the prostitution of the educational system are perhaps the most close at hand. We just need to understand that, figure out how to deal with it. Pontius Pilate rhetorically asked, well, what is truth? That's our challenge, to find out what is truth. That's why we have a separate avenue of study in our institute. The Berean Avenue is a study of the Word of God, primary. Eclipses everything else. But there's a second parallel that we also encourage study, and that's called, for lack of another name, the Issachar. To understand the times and know what we have to do in our environment. Churches themselves have life cycle. Did you realize that? We always talk about life cycles of governments and so forth and our things. Well, life cycles. We usually start with a people-oriented pastor. A guy who has a, a, a gift, a, 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 an affinity with people. He works pretty well. And pretty soon then he starts to get a following and he becomes pulpit-oriented. Ooh, start counting numbers. How many came Sunday? Hmm, that's interesting. And that goes through then. Pretty soon we have a building program. I know a lot of people who will join a church and the minute they hear there's a building program, they move on to another church. And it's not that they're adverse to giving, it's just they know they're going down a path here. So that path, now is a, it becomes a property-oriented, you know, crystal cathedral or what have you. The model, of course, is Gideon. When Gideon had his big victory, they said, well, you rule over us. No, but I'll take your gold. And what was the result of that? Huh? The 70 heirs were killed by the offspring of the concubine. Gideon's a story of snatching defeat from the jaws of victory. And that's what's going on in some major situations in the U.S. And from the property-oriented pastorate, you then come to the power-oriented pastorate. And get on the top committees and lead a, lead a charge to change the world. I can't see any place in the Bible where Jesus advises us to change the world. The world's our adversary, not our conquest. And uh, so we have the return of the Nicolaitans, in a sense. And then you finally get to politically driven decay. And I won't ask for a show of hands of how many of you have endured the pain of a division in a church when the pastor goes off with the wife of the youth leader or vice versa or whatever, um, the decay, life cycle churches. There's an ancient, more than as many centuries old poem that's carved in a Gothic medieval alphabet on a towering, ornate cathedral door right in the heart of a small town in Germany. I touched on this last night in a summary form, but I thought it would be worthwhile doing it. These, are, these were probably on that door in the days of Martin Luther and may have influenced his career for all we know. But it certainly he impacted the change of history. Thus speaks Christ to our Lord. This is a translation from the German. You call me eternal and do not seek me. You call me fair and then do not love me. You call me gracious, then do not trust me. You call me just and do not fear me. You call me life, then do not choose me. You call me light and do not see me. You call me Lord, then do not respect me. You call me master, then do not obey me. You call me merciful, then do not thank me. You call me mighty, then do not honor me. You call me noble, then do not serve me. You call me rich, then do not ask me. You call me Savior, then do not praise me. You call me shepherd, then do not follow me. You call me the way, and then do not walk with me. You call me wise, and then do not heed me. You call me son of God, and then do not worship me. When I condemn you, then do not blame me. And that's translated from the German from inscription on the cathedral door in Lübeck, Germany. The actual said condemn. I took that out of this because I didn't want to get into condemnation in Romans 8, 1 and go down that path. So I, I uh, apologize to my friend from whom I get this. But we'll move on. So that's our present predicament. I always, when I think of Laod the Laodicean age, I always think of that poem, that indictment that's there. Well, what are our resources? Okay, that's the bad news. What have we got to work with? What's our toolkit? Okay. Well, let's talk about the internet. There's lots of other things we can talk about, but let's just talk about the internet. Do you realize that all of mankind's knowledge is a couple of clicks away, if you know how to use it? It's astonishing to discover what you can get at on the internet if you know how. Well, there's all this bad stuff. Yes, of course there is. I'm glad there is. I applaud that it is. 
I'd be terrified if someone was editing that out that didn't necessarily agree with me. I applaud its availability. Yes, I'd regard some, I ought to filter that with some judgment, and it may have some implications for what my kids can get at. I understand that. But I applaud its availability. Everything you want. You want to find out the floor plan of your neighbor's house to burglarize it? You can find it. I'm not saying you should, but I use that just to get your attention, okay? And, uh, and uh, we have major conferences of hackers who take pride in getting through any firewall. So understand that there is some challenge out there. There's an th area called cyber war that's probably the primary front these days. And when China gets into the White House inside records, as they did a few weeks ago, that gets everybody's attention. <laughs> and it should, because there are remedies. There are just like every, you know, weapon and counter weapon. That's part of the, that's what the Association of Old Crows is all about and so forth. Those are the electric county uh, measure guys and so forth. But the point for us is the Word of God has never been more accessible. You think the Gutenberg Press was great. You can get at the original language in Greek or Hebrew without knowing Greek or Hebrew. You put your little arrow on any word in the English and up pops a little box. It'll tell you what the actual original word was in the Greek or the Hebrew. What parts of speech, plural, singular, and whatever. It'll even diagram the sentence if you ask it to. And the software to do that is free of charge. If you haven't discovered the Blue Letter Bible on the internet, that's just one of many options, but it's one of the best. You have hundreds of commentaries, hundreds of dictionaries that's available to you about anything, and it's all free of charge. The Word of God has never been more accessible. You, in 20 or 30 minutes, can do more at a terminal than a pastor used to be able to accomplish in six weeks of full-time study, if limited with manual lexicons and because it's word searchable and it's now and it's searchable in English or it's searchable in the original language. It's on it goes. And there are some very worthwhile, very expensive passage, uh, uh, packages you can buy. You can get them free and they're perfectly adequate. Most of our staff uses stuff that's free of charge. Some of us use stuff that would cost you $10,000 if you had it all. And we get it all because it's given to us for various reasons. So I'm not advocating that. I'm just saying I want to acknowledge that there are some packages around that are very, very worthwhile. And they're worth the money. They cost hundreds of dollars. You don't need those, though. You can get what you need with eSword, which is a giveaway, you can, and so on and so forth. Now, the information appliances are unparalleled. Most of us carry five or six Bibles around in our phone, and they're word searchable. Try doing that with the Schofield. Unbelievable. And many of us have our weekly or daily Bible study automatically uploaded so it's there when we ask for it. It's all done automatically. There's ways to do that. Find out how you can get that done if you don't know how. But there's something else that may be even more important than anything I've said so far. And that's the power of small groups. That's what's, I always want to see what Satan attacks. And he attacks small groups. Gets the pastor concerned about the, the, uh, the heresies that might occur in the neighborhood. As if he's the guardian for that. Power of small groups. I have studied the Bible for over 65 years. And the place I invariably see people grow is not from a 45-minute sermon once a week Sunday morning. It's from be meeting during the week in a small group, studying the Word of God. Not just meeting because it's fun. No, meeting to expositionally study the Word of God. I've invariably seen that be the site where people blossom and become uh, effective Christians. See, we live in a theater of miracles. The sovereign ways to make wine out of water. We saw that happen back, right, John? To make donkeys talk. That's my favorite line I use. If God can use Balaam's ass, he can use Chuck Missler. <laughs> <laughs> to make water flow from a rock twice. Twice. To part the sea on several occasions, not just at the... Anyway. To use ordinary people to accomplish extraordinary ends. That's the whole biblical tale then and is today. It is today. 
So I'm going to, it's a call to get back to basics. What is the church? Nothing that we've said so far this morning to get, comes close. The church is the secret and powerful society of the redeemed. That's what it is. It's a place where people can literally see the body of Christ. Not, not simply touched by an abbreviated gospel of evangelical blitzkrieg of short duration. A guy comes to town, he's very articulate, he's got the things, and they, we have a crowd get together, and a lot of people come down and make a commitment, and then what happens? Less than 1% or 2% are in church a year later. No, we want to return to the New Testament. Simplicity and its authenticity. That's what we're here for. You have spent money to come here to this conference, and you've gone, traveled a long way, and what is the call to get back to basics? That's basically it, what we're going to deal with here, but that may surprise you in what way. And there are no models. I'm going to show you one model, but it's not quite the same thing. Let the Spirit lead as He wills is really the banner that we want to fly here. How did it all start? A group of twelve. A group of twelve along the seashore. That's where it started. The birth of the church itself was in a house at Pentecost. That was in a house, believe it or not. Acts 2, check it out. The early church always met in houses, and in your notebook there, there's a whole list of these verses. You don't have to jot them down. They're in your lap with your workbook. Check them out. It's a, it's a very, very insightful discovery for many. And as a persecuted church, which it was, even before the resurrection, they were in closed doors, terrified. It was the only safe way to meet then, and it's going to be again. Some of us already are beginning to see the pinch of neighborhood restrictions or what have you that's coming. Not just in America, all over the world. The home church is the survivable one. Home fellowships. That was the original form of fellowship. All instances of the book of Acts were in homes. Formal churches, as we think of them, were invented in the third century by the state. Home fellowships were ostracized by the medieval church, of course, under penalty of death, by the reformed churches. After the Reformation, the same kind of power grasping occurred among our venerated leaders. And to this very day, many churches try to stamp out home studies or twist them or somehow gain, regain what they feel is a loss of control. Really. So obviously home churches are also, the reason we're emphasizing all this isn't only because it's more effective anyway, but it's also the only viable form for an underground church. And one of the reasons that we uh, are meeting is because we believe that all of us in this room increasingly will experience, as the years take off, increasing restrictions in our ability to worship, our ability to fellowship. Yes, and even our ability to pray. In America, it's illegal to pray in public. They're trying, anyway. <laughs> the advantage of small groups. Disciplined multiplication. When a group gets more than 12 or 20, whatever, split into two. That's called mitosis. It's the most effective form of biological growth is mitosis. And uh, it's free of any growth barriers. There's no, nothing that prevents your group, group going from 12 to 20. But when it gets to 20, think about two tens. And that, that, see, that gets exponential as you start thinking about it. It's not linear, it's exponential. That's exciting. And the participants are more involved. They're not in a spectator sport. If you're attending a group here, this, if, it get, if it gets any larger, it becomes a spectator sport. It's small enough here when we have a break, we can ask questions of each other. Hey, what do you mean by that? Oh, hey, have you seen this? Or, hey, th there's interaction. Can you imagine? You're participants, not spectators. That's profound. That means there's more personal transformation and accountability. Yes. A small group is fabulous for the new Christian because you can ask questions without being embarrassment. 
but it also is better for the group because you're starting to be accountable in a, in, 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 in a sense. And so it's more effective for new Christians, as I mentioned. It, uh, and it also solves the leadership crisis because you know who will lead in the small group? The Holy Spirit. Yeah, indeed. And that's, and that's exciting to watch. It's exciting to have a group of people meet. You don't have to have a, a, a teacher. You need a leader to sort of keep things orderly, but you don't have a t- you need to you put, you put a DVD in the thing and listen for 30 minutes or whatever and talk about it. And watch what happens when the Holy Spirit takes over. You'll have a group of five, six, eight, ten people, and when they leave, something will have emerged among them that they, no one brought into the room. An insight that the Holy Spirit emerged from the dialogue. And when you watch that happen and realize what happens, it blows your mind to realize there's an unseen presence of the Holy Spirit himself by highlighting something that somebody didn't pre-plan to bring in. That helps to have some preparation, don't misunderstand me, but that also can be a straitjacket. That's the danger of PowerPoint here. I've got a little package thing to get in within 50 minutes or whatever. You know, that's the, there's an advantage to that. It's efficient, but if it's a springboard to further study, great. But it's also a form of straitjacket because the Holy Spirit may have something he wants to bring up that wasn't anticipated in my stupid little slides. You know, the old thing we used to say in business was, beware the pox, beware the ides, beware the man with the colored slides. You know <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's more biblical, and it's also a persecu- persecution-proof structure. And it's more efficient. There's no cost. You don't have to subsidize a professional hireling to lead your Bible studies. Most of you know people that are f- fabulous leaders among you that are unpaid. Paul was and so on. So, it's a way of life, not a series of meetings, is one of our thoughts here. The way is what it's called in Acts 18 and elsewhere. And there's no such thing as a house of God. That's a secular term, okay? People say, God does not live in temples made by human hands. Let's understand that. Well, they're chewing gum in the sanctuary. No, 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 no. Sanctuaries are chewing gum. (laughs) We're the sanctuaries. He's indwelling us if we're regenerated. There is no bureaucratic clergy in the New Testament. That's an invention in the third century. And uh, no clerical mediators. Clerical is the right term. I was going to try to correct that. I would say clerical. But clerical is also in the dictionary refers to a man of the cloth. So you don't... And the Nicolaitans was an idea that was adopted from pagan religions, of course. And you also have line or staff. If you're in an organization, you have line people and staff people. Staff people are not the productive ones. They may, they may be part of an, a necessary part of overhead, but they're not productive. So what are you, what, you know, let's, let's us be productive, not overhead. Huh? So alternatives. Well, there, are, there is a role for megachurches. That's the big thing today. And I'm not here to disparage them. They have a role. There's a value there. And uh, there's the local congregational church. I'm not here to disparage that. Many people misunderstand my once and future church presentation because they think I'm anti-church. Not at all. I am pro-home ch- uh, home fellowships. But I think they, 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 they are the part that's essential. Those are not. They're useful. I'm not disparaging them. But that's not where the action is. The small study group. And even more than that, I'm going to say the expositional study group. And I'll come back to that. Now, one of the healthiest are cells that are sponsored by the local church. You have the best of both. And uh, I was startled when the Institute started getting a membership. I had people send emails. Boy, we sure appreciate the Coin Institute because we don't have to leave our church now. What's all that about? I found, and I found out by dialogue what they're talking about. They love their church. They love their pastor. They love the programs for the kids. There's all kinds of reasons they like the church. They're frustrated because they're not getting taught. So by the institute being available on the internet, they can plug that hole. They don't have to leave their church to get taught and to grow. They, they get everything else they want, which is important. And so the combination is important. Home fellowships is a key part of the picture. Home churches, if you will, and there's a subtle difference. I, won't, I don't think it's relevant. So I want to have candor here without malice. I'm not here to disparage anyone. I think we need to understand history for its truth. But uh, we're not with malice. There are critical assessments we need to continue to make. That's what the seven churches' letters are all about. Jesus is making a critical assessment. And uh, so the historical reality, both 
Hegel said, uh, history teaches us that man learns nothing from history. George Santayana said it another way, he that doesn't know history is doomed to repeat it. We need to understand that, re that we want to, what we're trying to do with the Institute is to get the best of the past and not shackle ourselves to the errors of the past. And that's part of what the, we'll talk about here in a minute. And uh, there are roles for every variety of fellowship. And uh, the idea of network cells, one of the things that I'm really convinced of in business as well as survival of the church is our personal network. You have a personal network of people you trust spiritually. You want to grow that and nurture it and invest in it. You each need your own private network of where you can fellowship with candor and comfort. So, see, small groups are organic. They're not organized, they just happen. They're relational, not formal. They're a per persecution-proof structure. They mature under tears. They multiply under pressure. They flourish in the desert. They see in the dark. They thrive on chaos. And the only boast they make is the lamb, our king, or the lion, if you prefer. Now, there are some issues here. A small group may have a specific goal that you need to understand. And it isn't necessarily evangelistic. Oh boy, we got six people came up over at the house the other night and three of them accepted Christ. Praise God, that's wonderful. I'm not knocking that. Don't misunderstand me. But that may not be the reason you're meeting. Everybody presumes that the reason we meet and get a neighborhood group together is to lead people to Christ. Not necessarily. That isn't necessarily the best way. It may be a good way. Don't misunderstand me. I'm trying to point out there may be a much more important role for that group to be meeting. And that might be discipleship. There are some groups that have learned that it's important not to have newcomers. A friend of mine was visiting Korea. A doctor he knew there, and he was there. He said, would you like to come to our home fellowship? Oh, I'd love to. You know, particularly Warren Duffy's experience. Uh, he said, well, I'll, I'll call and see if I can get permission. Okay. So he calls the leader. And they normally pray about it before they bring a newcomer, but he, they made an exception and let him come. Oh, that's great. So they got in his Mercedes and they drove an hour. It wasn't in the neighborhood. It was all a group of doctors. They all had something in common beside, the Christ, beside Christ. And they also have learned that for their own growth, they get encumbered by having a newcomer because they want to go on from wherever they are, you see. So they have a rule that to bring, a, to, to bring a, a newcomer, you have to get permission. They usually pray about it before they allow it. See, it's a different, I'm not saying it's the right way, it's just, it, I'm trying to stretch our imagination. there's different ways to go, you see. It's my understanding of the Wesley Revival, back as famous, and they had different, what they called bands, or we'd call them groups. And there's a kind of group you met if you're a newcomer. For the first few weeks of Christian, you met in that kind of a group. And after you were in that for a few months, then you could go into the next group. And after you were there a year or two, then you can go to the main group. I mean, they had, they had them categorized. Some of them were co-ed, some were not, men only, women only. They had them split. They had a whole program that they laid out, which is, I'm not advocating necessarily. It went very, very healthy. They, uh, they had, uh, I think, one in 30 in Britain, a member of that all, before it all fell apart. When the Wesley brothers died, it all started to fall apart, and for whatever reason. So it, I, I, the point is, what I'm, getting, what I'm saying, what's interesting though, they recognize that a group is an organ that can benefit by having some integrity of its own. And a newcomer punctures that to some extent. So there's ways to deal with that. Have two different kinds of groups, whatever, you can work that out. But the point is, the mission is relevant. And the leadership here. It's nice to have prepared teachers, but it's not hard to be prepared. If you're in a group, it's not hard, if you're studying a book of the Bible, to stay one chapter ahead of your group. You, you, know, you, you spend the weekend doing a little study so that when Tuesday night or whenever it is comes by and you met together, you've done a little bit of homework. You've got at least some questions to ask. You don't have to have all the answers. That's key, but being prepared makes sense. You really need to be a discussion facilitator. That just takes some thought. Don't let one person dominate to, to draw people out so everybody's participating. And there is a value in having a semi-structured approach so that you move along some sense of progress, some sense of credentials, what have you. But uh, so, 
There's another issue to deal with here, and that is the special challenges we face today. And, uh, you know, there's, uh, let's talk a little bit about that. The, uh, Augustine is famous for an admonition that hangs in the lobby of my wife's ministry, and I love it. Augustine apparently is it's attributed to him. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. But in all things, agape. Precious, precious things. In essentials, unity. Non-essentials, liberty. We should be free to have differences of view on some of these peripheral passages. There are some things about which you, we need to be unified. The sufficiency of Christ, for sure. And there's a few others. So what are essentials? Well, the Trinity is one of them. That's important to understand. The Trinity from the Old as well as the New Testament. Crucial concept. That's an area we need to really be comfortable that we agree on. And the ultimate in all that is the sufficiency of Christ. To try to add to what he did is blasphemy. We need to understand that. Crucial. The sufficiency of Christ. He not only was God, he was also man. Complete in both cases. And the Gospel. Most people cannot define the Gospel. What do you mean the Gospel? Good news. What do you mean good news? You can't do this and you can't do that. That's good news. What are you talking about? What is the Gospel? No, the Gospel is defined in 1 Corinthians 15, first four verses. Paul defines it for us. How that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, He rose again the third day. Period. That's it. No mention of miracles, no mention of His teachings, no mention of His example. No, 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 no. It's what He did is the Gospel. He did it all for us. God, the extremes that God went to on our behalf is the flabbergasting good news. We need to understand it. And what's disturbing about that is that you can't find it in churches. Find a church that preaches the blood of Christ as our basis for approaching the throne. Wow. Really? Yeah. The gospel. We need to understand that. Basic stuff. The other thing that we tend to emphasize is what's called hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is a fancy word for your theory, theory of interpretation. If you take the Bible seriously, literally, you have a different outcome than if you sort of figure, well, it's some of it's the Word of God. If you if you're that, have that attitude, then you're being the judge of what is and isn't. No, no. We've, I've, in the 65 years I've studied the Bible, many, many times throughout that history I've had to change my view as I learned. But it's always been in the direction of taking the text more seriously than before. And that's caused me to be an extremist on that point of view. I don't, believe, I don't believe there's any synonyms. I think two words can be synonymous and they mean almost the same thing. Watch out for almost. There's a gap in there that can be a treasure if you discover it. Hermeneutics is our primary cornerstone of everything we do. And I'll talk about the epistemological cycle before we're through. And so there are some major challenges here. There are some specific doctrinal challenges. What about replacement theology? I can walk into a strange church being there the first time and if I find out how they feel about Israel, I know a lot about their hermeneutics. Do they take Israel seriously? That doesn't solve all the problems, don't misunderstand me, but at least I, that, that, that's a litmus test that covers miles, if you will. The gifts of the Spirit. It's astonishing to me to discover some of the most conservative seminaries in America are tremendous in what they have a history for and yet they're totally blind about the gifts of the Spirit because of the abuses in that area. The gifts are for today. How do I know that? Because it says so. In Acts chapter 2, they had the gift of tongues being given. And Peter quotes Joel chapter 2. This is that which Joel predicted would come. But Joel is talking about the end times, the day of the Lord. So if that started, there's no place it ends until the day of the Lord. So whatever they are, they're, for, they're not terminated. And attempts to terminate are, are really... Uh, Dallas Theological Seminary is one of those seminaries that for, for years has taught that the gifts of the Spirit are... They, they were only until the canon was complete. Their concept was, by a misunderstanding of another verse, I won't borrow with you now, but they build a, try to build a case that when the canon is complete, then the gifts were uh, no longer needed, which is nonsense. So I t tell my D Dallas friends, well, what about Revelation 10? What do you mean? Well, John heard the seven thunders utter their voice. And he heard what they said. He was about to write. He said, see, thou do it not. 
So he knew what they said. He was about to write it. But he was forbidden to write it. Why? My premise to them, I say, well, that's because the canon's not complete until he does. So any doctrine built on the canon being complete is frail. And they thought I was being facetious. I was dead serious. No, that's nonsense. No, the gifts are for today. That doesn't mean much of what masquerades as the gifts is legitimate. Don't misunderstand me. Walter Martin used to have fun. Walter Martin was one that prayed in tongues privately. But he also, when he was a young minister, had raised a girl from the dead in New Guinea. It was published in Christianity Today, so it's something that people that know Walter know about his background. And he used to, he used to love to get with one of the Pentecostals. And when he found out what they were after, he said, uh, well, gee, do you have the gift of raising the dead? Well, well, no. And Walter, in his unique way, would just fall crestfallen. Oh, well, I'll pray for you so that you might enter into, and he'd start giving this line that one gift is above another, and he's obviously being sarcastic. No, the gifts are gifts severally as they will. That's the difference between being charismatic and being Pentecostal. Being charismatic implies that you believe the gifts are for today, and you can defend that from the Scripture. If you're Pentecostal, if you are insisting that one gift is above another, you're violating 1 Corinthians 12 and, four, yeah, 12 and 14, 14 especially. And so it's interesting that the only place that tongues are dealt with in the Bible is to the Corinthians, which were the most carnal fellowship of the whole list, interestingly enough. But 12, 13, and 14 are the answer. 12 introduces it, 14 talks about the abuses, but right in the middle, Paul says, I show you a better way. And you have 1 Corinthians 13 is the ultimate rebuttal. But the gifts of the Spirit are crucial. It's crucial that they're operative here in this conference before we leave uh, tomorrow morning. And the kingdom perspective, the whole idea that Jesus is, that, that when, we, when we pray in the Lord's Prayer, thy, thy kingdom come, what are we talking about? We're talking about Him taking His kingdom. And He confirms that. Gabriel told Mary that he would sit on David's throne. He never has. He's, he has yet to do that. Jesus himself confirmed it at his ascension. It's not for you to know the time, but I'm going to do it, in other words. And so forth. And the pivotal event in the book of Acts was Acts 15, the Council of Jerusalem, which, among other things, deals with what's going to happen to Israel. And James, the half-brother of Jesus, quotes from Amos chapter 9, verse 11 and 12 that God is going to reestablish the, the tabernacle of David. That's not the temple of Solomon. It's a tabernacle of David. It's a palace of the king. That's yet coming. That gets into the whole issue of the Bema seat judgments and all that. Then we have, those, we have these strange groups, the dominions, that say that the church is supposed to get the world ready for the second coming of Christ. That's utter nonsense. It's totally contrast to what the Bible really teaches. We'll get to that when we get to start studying um, Isaiah 63 and so forth. We also discovered when we published our book, The Kingdom of Power and Glory, there was a, a view widely held in, among certain groups that I didn't even know existed. It's called hyperdispensationalism. Being dispensationalist is very easy to defend for a lot of reasons, but hyperdispensationalism are those people who believe that the church was born in Acts chapter 2 and everything prior to that was given to unbelieving Jews. That the only thing a Gentile has to deal with are the epistles. Which is utter nonsense, by the way, because Paul says, whatsoever are written for time are written for our learning. That whatsoever is all of it. But there are some that try to, to uh, avoid most of the teachings of the Gospels under that, this very strange... And what's so strange about this view is that not only is it not defendable, it also uh, is, is, is uh, uh, not fruit-bearing. It's astonishing that they, ha they have that view so militantly, we discovered. Strange stuff. And then we have the whole problem of cults in general, the Mormons, the Jehovah's Witnesses, and so forth. Every cult has a way of somehow denying the deity of Christ. And so if you're really strong in the sufficiency of Christ, you'll have an answer for each one of those, and each one has uh, resources available to deal with if you want to. But the key thing in our world is hermeneutics. And you have three stages of that. The first thing is what we call exegesis. What does the text really say? That's your first step. What does it really say? And in today's world, that's not they're, they're, the, the places where that's a, a, a debate is in very specialized areas. What you really then move into is what's called exposition. What does the text mean? And it's my strong admonition that if you have a home group and that you take a book of the Bible and go at it verse by verse, chapter by chapter, and just see what this says and exposit it. It's an expositional study. 
And of course, what comes out of that is homiletics. How do you apply it to your walk? That's, that's the so what question. So what do I do about it? And that's usually a very practical thing that will emerge from the discussion. How do you handle difficult passages? There's a whole bunch of things that we suggest. But one of the first things to do is you don't have to take sides. In a small group, you find something that has a difficult passage. No problem. Don't feel you have to resolve it. The Holy Spirit will resolve it in His own way, in His own time. He will. And one of the secrets about doing that is simply put Jesus Christ right in the middle and see what happens. If there's a knot, you'll discover it just unravels. These weird little rules in the Old Testament, you wonder, what on earth was that all about? And when you study it, you discover it's all about the Messiah. The cities of refuge are all about the Messiah. Most people don't realize that. The, uh, the, and we could go on example, but that gets us into all the side roads. Expositional teaching. The whole Council of God. We have a strong uh, affinity for architectural issues. You want to study the whole Council of God verse by verse, chapter by chapter. And uh, what I encourage you to grasp is a recognition of the systematic design of the total package. Once you begin to realize that the 66 books are an integrated message, deliberately designed, every detail deli there deliberately, it changes your whole approach. And you suddenly see how it all fits together. And you only get that with expositional teaching. Anybody that's an artist knows exactly what I'm talking about. If you do a painting, you know that every dab of color on that canvas affects every other color. That's why artists typically try to cover it all with at least some tentative suggestion, and they gradually make it more and more specific. But every dab of that brush affects every other part of the canvas. That's what an artist discovers, and it's intrinsic to his craft. Well, the same thing's true of the Bible. Every verse impacts and is impacted by every other verse. You need to understand that. It's a fabric, and every verse impacts every other one. And every verse in the Bible reveals something about Christ. Where is Jesus Christ in the Bible? On every page. And I believe I could even defend the idea it's on every verse. It's all about Him. He says so in Psalm 40, verse 7. The volume of the book is written of me, He says. That's quoted also in the Epistle of Hebrews. There is a place for topical teaching. Most people like to take a topic and teach it. That's very hazardous. That focuses on specific doctrines or problem areas. And that will happen. I'm not disparaging it, but I want you to realize the caution when you do that. Because you run, you run some risks by doing that. It can be hazardous. Because you can extra you take an extracted segment that involves editing and it will reveal biases. And they're always there. So understand that. When you're going verse by verse through the whole Bible, you constrain yourself pretty much to what the Bible is saying. When you take a topic like the Holy Spirit or baptism or the Lord's Supper or some topic, it's a worthwhile topic, but it's hazardous because you're going, you can exclude segments that you didn't mean to include. And uh, you can result, what they say, majoring on the minors. You can take something that's less important than the total thing and spend your life. There are people making careers of a verse. You know? Long-term values. If you have a long-term perspective of the Bible, you will lean toward expositional approaches. Take a book, any one of them, go at it verse by verse, chapter by chapter, and you're on safe ground. And you probably have heard me do this before, but when you find a verse that you don't understand, rejoice. Get a, note, get a, a, a journal that's going to be secret, your own private thing. Find a page, put down the reference, and try to write what confuses you about that verse. Why does it confuse you? Try to express that, and do it in ink, not pencil. I'll show you why. Once you've done that, then you take it before the Lord. Say, Lord, you promised that you would teach me, the Holy Spirit would teach me all things. Not most, all things. I'm confused about this verse. I don't understand it. I'm asking you in the, in the name of Jesus to reveal what that means to me. In the name of His name, I position. And, and, and watch what happens. Not necessarily in the next 10 seconds. But what will happen is something will occur in your life that will make that verse obvious. It may be something you hear on the radio on an unrelated matter. It might be something you overhear in a conversation in a restaurant. It can be, who knows, what the but the Holy Spirit will bring something across your path that will unravel that. I want you to go back to that journal, put that, find that page, and write down the date, the time of how the Holy Spirit revealed it to you and what it means. 
You do this all in ink, so you can't change it by rationalizing later. You say, Chuck, I like that. Why, why all the paperwork? I'll tell you why. That journal will be one of your most treasured collections. You don't show it to anybody because I want you to stay candid with it. You don't show it to anybody. You don't, there's no pride here, just you and the, the journal and the Holy Spirit. Because what's going to happen is you're going to go through the valley of doubt. And you're going to have times that you wonder, boy, have I just gotten carried away with it all. You go back to that journal and re-examine the places where the Holy Spirit guided you through that doubt. How he carried you. And that will become one of your most treasured possessions. Hermeneutics, there are several levels. There's the, there's the literal, the, 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 this is in Hebrew. The Bashat is the literal sense, of course, of the text. The Remez is the hint of something deeper. The Darash is the homiletics, the spiritual message that's there, the, hum, the practical application. Those three we have in Gentile hermeneutics, but there's the, the Hebrews ask a fourth one called the Sod, the mystical conjectures about it. And they memorize the four of these by the, the word pardes, which can mean paradise or garden, either what, depending on what vowels you point for it. But that's, their, that's the, uh, the Hebrew hermeneutics. If I know your eschatology, the first break, break is, are you amillennial or premillennial? Most churches, unfortunately, are amillennial. There used to be postmillennial, but most of that has evaporated pretty much because everybody recognizes things are not getting better and better, that we are not in the millennium yet. <laughs> Preterism is a form of amillennialism that's, that's, uh, that uh, is, isn't even consistent. I won't go down that path here. But most of us are premillennial, but even us are divided into three groups, post-trib, mid-trib, or pre-trib, depending on where you think the church fits relative to the tribulation. Most denominations are amillennial and post-tribulational. Most people who are independent, fundamental Bible believers are at the other end of the thing. They're fundamentalists. And that depends on your hermeneutics. If you take the Bible very, very literally, you'll, be, you'll swing on the right side of that diagram. If you're willing to allegorize, treat the scripture just as a metaphor or an allegory, your freedom to do that would be on the left side. And so if I know your hermeneutics, I can predict your eschatology. Okay, so that's pretty straightforward. I can also, if I look at versions of the Bible, some of them are driven by verbal equivalency, Dead Sea Scrolls being the ultimate example, and uh, dynamic equivalency, putting it in modern language. That's a trade-off every translator has to deal with. And of course, we choose to stay with the King James for a number of reasons. Every one of them has problems, but the problems of the King James are well known and well documented. So there's an epistemic, if I know your hermeneutics, hermeneutics, I know your eschatology. But here's the interesting thing, if I know your eschatology, most uh, from, from that little chart I showed you, then um, I can predict your ecclesiology. Most controversies of eschatology are really not eschatological controversies, they're ecclesiology they're of the church. If I know your eschatology of the church, you see, from that little diagram we went through last night, uh, then I know, your, uh, I, I know your ecclesiology. Well, if I know your ecclesiology, I can also predict your hermeneutics by the willingness of how seriously you take the Bible. So what's interesting, this whole thing is self-regenerative, okay? is that it all, the, her, the tighter hermeneutics sharpens your eschatology, or eschatology will sharpen your understanding of the church in the end times, that's what we're here for, <laughs> and that will impact your hermeneutics. If you survive the cycle a few times, you will be driven, so to speak, into a tighter and higher hermeneutic, and all the other problems will fall out of it. In any case, it always points to the Messiah, and that's the secret. To epistemology is the study of knowledge, its scope, and limits, and uh, that's, that's the model we're following here. So that leaves us with one last topic, the Koine Institute. And I want to talk a little bit about the KI model. I want you to understand our statement of faith, because you, you'll see where you may fit or not fit with us. It's very minimalistic. And uh, we'll talk about the heuristic commitment, our threefold structure, and the fact that, and then how we're governed. We'll go through all of that here in a minute. So the statement of faith, three parts that the Bible is the very Word of God, is inerrant in its original autographs, and is fully and totally and uniquely reliable as the primary guide to all actions and commitments. That's our primary commitment in the Institute, and we hope you're comfortable with that. Second one, that Jesus Christ is God incarnate, became man to fill a destiny in our behalf, was crucified, buried, and bodily resurrected, is presently seated on his Father's throne, and will soon return to establish his kingdom on the planet Earth. Very simple. And that last phrase will exclude nine out of ten churches, strangely enough. 
And the third, and I'm not sure about the statistic, that's just a horseback guess. But the third one then is that in the meantime, the Holy Spirit is uniquely active in pursuing His mission in calling, equipping, and empowering believers, and is essential for any and all the pursuits of the Institute to be fruitful and effective. That's it, period. There are a lot of people with whom we would disagree that are perfectly comfortable under that umbrella. That means we have non-essentials that we can have a lot of joy over. So everybody knows what Coin House, our publisher, but the Coin Institute is a relatively new creation that God has done for just as such a time as this. And I want you to understand the three legs of that stool. Berean, Iskar, and Coinus, we call it. Berean, of course, is after Acts 17.11. That's been our trademark for four or five decades. And the, that uh, receive the word will all open us the mind, but search the scriptures daily to prove whether those things be so. But the second one is a different pursuit altogether. To be like the sons of Iskar in that they understood the times and knew what their country had to do. And we've discovered the resources and tools of those two avenues of study are antithetical. In the Berean every we know the Bible's true, the challenge is to understand it. In the Issachar, what we're dealing with are intelligence reports, news clips, what have you, we know they're biased. We know they're not true. The trick is what is really true? Different set of tools, different resources. Those two should go in parallel, we believe. Berean being dominant, of course, but Issachar needs to accompany it. That's what makes us distinctive from a seminary or a Bible college, is the existence of that second avenue of study, in side by side. And that all leads to action which we call the koinonos, which is a term for uh, fellowship and communication. It's motivated by the third commandment. That's why I asked that question earlier. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. We argue that the action of all of this is ambassadorship. The reason you study the Bible, the reason you study what's going on is to be His ambassador. That's in relevant terms to today. That's That's what it's all about. That's why the Institute is not a seminary. It's something quite unique. We encourage the members of the Institute to balance all three of these, not to become a specialist. Yes, you know your word, but yes, you also know what's going on in the world, and yet you're committed to a calling of some kind. And when you've got to the first level of all three, we award it with a trail marker we call a bronze medallion. When you get to the second level of all three, you get a bronze and ultimately gold. But our goal is not a gold medallion. It's a golden crown on a glassy sea. These are just trail markers to make it fun, to give it, to make it... uh, I feel that you're making some progress here. All of this can be done for university credit. We actually have four or five, six maybe now, PhDs in which the transcripts that were awarded on the basis of the transcripts for the Institute. They're increasing. We don't give the degrees. The universities do, but they do it on the basis of the respect for the, the work product that we're dealing with from the Institute and for that's worth. So the trail markers for diligent. That's why we have these these medallions. They're big and clumsy and they only, we only use them at certain ceremonial occasions. But uh, for such a time as this, are you saved? Praise God. Well then, have you discovered your calling? And that's what we want to deal with for the rest of this day, by the way, to help you discover your calling. Are you in a fellowship that's committed to preparing you for that calling? That's a question. What have you invested in that preparation. I'm not talking about dollars, your time. What have you committed to it? What has it done to your priorities? Ooh, that's an interesting question. Give me a chance to think about that later today. How are we governed? Many people don't really understand this, and that's part of our mission in the next few weeks to go up there. We have some annual meetings from all over the world to come together. We're going to solidify some of these things. But we have an international trust that was created a, t- a decade ago here in New Zealand, and it's run by a Council of Elders. But there are f- three councils, one for each avenue. A council for the Berean Avenue, a council for the Issachar, and a council for th- that. These are the people that determine the policies of each of those councils. The operations are run by uh, uh, Coin and House in Idaho and through Lion's Head Media here in New Zealand. And the chairman of the three policies are Lewis Powell. He's the one that's invented these little crosses that include a MP3 player for all our teachings that our audio that we hands out to missionaries in New Guinea or wherever by the hundreds and they, they cost 10 bucks a piece. They're astonishing. Everything we know is in a, in a little cross that they can wear around and they can listen and solar powered and what have you. And then uh, Steve Elwert is our head of Issachar and he's been appointed to the National uh, Intelligence Council uh, in the United States because of his, for a number of reasons. 
And I love it when they, he, there's a number of titles he could use when he appears publicly, but he loves to say, Senior Analyst for Coin Institute. <laughs> What's the Institute? People ask the right question, that's good. <laughs> and Larry Matuda heads up the coin list. Now the operations, of Mark Gustafson is our Chief Operating Officer in Idaho. And he has a staff, a small, tight, highly motivated staff that, that uh, executes the things that need to be done to implement the, uh, but the operations are separate from policy. So we have the Janine model of govern corporate governance going here. And we have Ron Madsen who runs Lionshead Media, the entity here, that is the, that formulates the materials that Coiny House distributes, so to speak. That's, that's the way, the direction we're going here. And the, uh, the chairman here of the councils, uh, of the three councils, always elect a vice chairman. The chairman serves, the, he serves for two years as vice chairman, then two years as chairman, and then two years as post chairman. And there's a rollover from that. So, so you get six years of commitment of a trained person overlapping. It's a great, great, great concept. Coiny House operates through a provost, and we have deputy provosts being established around the world. We have a deputy provost here for New Zealand. He lives up in, uh, in the North Shore, and, uh, uh, so, uh, and we'll be growing that as it goes. Now I might point out that um, Ron is actually running a wholly owned subsidiary of a corporation called Lions Head Development Corporation, which is owned by the trust. So we have a corporate, we have a corporate legal arm that's a resource to the trust that Lionshead Media is, uh, is, is uh, operating. We are going, we're in the process of installing a endowment fund also under the trust as the assets, as we get ahead of our debt and get on top of it. And so that's the, now something else you should understand, the parts that are in green are volunteers. That we do have a paid staff in Idaho that are salaried uh, implementers, if you will. But everything else here is done um, as, uh, by volunteers that you see in green, for what it's worth. The provost is a salaried executive under Mark Gustafson. The deputy provost in the regions are volunteers. It's almost a full-time job, I understand that, it's sort of like the Boy Scout being a scout, a scout troop leader or something. But anyway, that's the concept. So there we are. The true church is a supernatural invention endowed with immortality. The, it's the means to disciple each other, it's to transfer Jesus' life to each other, and it turns atheists to apostles, police women into prophetesses, terrorists into teachers, plumbers into pastors, and elders into evangelists, and so forth. We have an army of nobodies, whether they're under persecution or celebrated on talk shows, under unspeakable difficulties or walking on red carpets, despised or adored, ridiculed or consulted, cheated or honored, scorned or quoted, tortured or pampered, with frequent flyer cards or walking barefoot, no, unknown or known. Some strange resumes in the background here. Moses was 80 years old and wanted for murder. Did you realize that? Jacob was a schemer and a con artist. You never buy a used car from Jacob. Hmm? Elijah and Jeremiah both suffered from depression. They were. And Hosea couldn't keep his marriage together. Amos was a farmer with no ministry training. Peter tried to kill a man with a sword. John Mark was a quitter. Paul couldn't get along with his partner Barnabas and couldn't stay out of prison. Well, one last thing and we'll wrap it up here. In 1980, a young man from Rwanda was forced by his tribe to either renounce Christ or face certain death. He refused to renounce Christ and he was killed on the spot. When they went into his room, the night before they found uh, he had written uh, a commitment that was nailed to the wall. He says, I'm part of the fellowship of the unashamed. I have Holy Spirit power. The die's been cast, I've stepped over the line, the decision's been made, I'm a disciple of His. I won't look back, let up, throw down, back away, or be stilled. My past is redeemed. My present makes sense. My future is secure. Wow. I'm finished with low living, sight walking, small planning, smooth knees, colorless dreams, tame visions, mundane talking, cheap living, and dwarfed goals. I love this guy. I no longer need preeminence, prosperity, position, promotion, plaudits, or popularity. There's enough alliteration there, you know he went to seminary. <laughs> I don't have to be right, first, tops, recognized, praised, regarded, or rewarded. I now live by faith, lean on His presence, walk by patience, lift by prayer, and labor by power. My face is set, my gate is fast, my goal is heaven, my road is narrow, my way rough, my companions few, my guide reliable, my mission clear. I cannot be bought, compromised, detoured, lured away, turned back, deluded, or delayed. I love this guy. 
I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice, hesitate in the presence of adverse adversary, negotiate the, at the table of the enemy, ponder at the pool of popularity, or meander in the maze of mediocrity. <laughs> Eloquent kid here. I won't give up, shut up, or let up until I have stayed up, stored up, prayed up, paid up, and preached up for the cause of Christ. <laughs> Boy. I'm a disciple of Jesus. I will go till he comes. I will give till I drop. Preach till all know. And work till he stops me. And when he comes for his own, he'll have no problems recognizing me. My banner will be clear. So with that, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for who you are. and We thank you for bringing us together. And we thank you, Father, for the challenges that face us here. We thank you for your presence and we ask for your guidance that you would open our hearts and lives to what you would have of us in the days ahead as we commit ourselves with great joy and great commitment into your hands. In the name of Yeshua, our coming King indeed. Amen.